I'm super honored to be here tonight. I spent about 21 years on a middle or high school campus. Um, super enjoyed being part of a staff and truly missed that piece of it. Uh, but in 2016, I had spent about 14 years watching smartphones and devices and social media really impact my own students. And then during that time, um, I decided to have, you know, four kids in three years. So um, currently the parents of four teenage daughters, ages 14, 14, 16, and 17. Uh, so I'm currently in the trenches trying to figure this out as a parent as well. Um, so 2016, um, that year for some reason was like rock and roll with my students. Um, drugs were being traded, students were being cyber bullied. I had a student who unfortunately met up with a predator at a park and was harmed. And I was like, this is insane. I've got to go do something. So I just took a huge leap of faith and left uh, public school. Um, and I've been on the road for about six or seven years doing this work and just thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, during the pandemic, I was lucky enough uh, as school shut down, who are my clients, um, to pivot over to a company called uh, Bark for Schools. Um, so Bark has two sides of the house. Uh, Bark for Schools sits in G Suite or Microsoft Office 365, and we surveil and monitor and alert school administration as well as counseling staff and sometimes law enforcement um, to anything that you know a school would be worried about, ranging from, again, cyberbullying to predation, sexting, drugs and alcohol, uh, anxiety, depression, self-harm, and of course, threats of violence towards the school. Um, kids are pretty savvy. They have uh, figured out that parents are monitoring their own personal devices and social media, so they have switched over uh, to their school accounts to do things that are wildly uh, inappropriate, developmentally typical, um, but also uh, using Google Docs as sort of a journal mechanism. And so we do find in uh, school-issued accounts that students are sort of journaling their feelings, and sometimes those feelings are distressful. And so, um, as Joy said, we're protecting almost 6 million students as of today, actually. So I'm super proud to be part of that work. Uh, it's hard sometimes to see what we're alerting on and the access that we've given to our students. On the family side of the house, uh, we have a subscription-based service. It's about $10, $11 a month um, for parents to be able to get those same alerts. So you sync your device with your students' accounts. Um, we monitor and surveil probably 150 different social media networks, text messaging, group chats, like anything kids are using. The only company that won't allow us in to alert parents to safety issues is the wonderful Snapchat, um, which is where, you know, tweens and teens like to spend their time. So um, if you're looking for a service to give you peace of mind, um, what happens is a student, maybe student A is talking to student B, they're having a conversation about something concerning, that snippet of the conversation gets sent to your phone or device that you've uh, synced. And then underneath uh, the snippet of conversation is a couple tips uh, from a clinical psychologist um, that gives you some things to think about before you talk to your student about what you just read. So um, I use Bark, have used Bark for the last five years for my own children. Um, I get dozens of alerts per day. Um, some of them are my own children and things that they're talking about. Um, most of them are the friendship group and or other people trying to contact uh, my girls. And so with that, um, you get to choose what you want to know about. Um, having four teenagers, I did go ahead and uncheck the box on the profanity filter um, because I was getting lots of alerts um, from their friendship group, from classmates, you know. So you get to choose what you want to know about. What I can say with fidelity is that there's no mystery to your kid's life. Everything you want to know is on their device, whether they're seven or eight or 15 or even 18. Um, these kids have a lot, necessarily your children that you need to worry about. It's the access 
that we've given to explicit content, the exposure to be able to bully somebody overnight, online, any time of the day. Um, I, I really, truly feel that our kids are under attack, and I felt that way for a long time. So um, in my older age, as a 49.99-year-old, um, I just say it how it is now, and I don't worry about it because I really, really believe that uh, technology is a tool. It's a great positive tool, but it can also be used um, in ways that our kids don't know what to do about. So um, I'm going to say a whole lot tonight in a very short amount of time. So if you're looking for me, I want to be a resource to you. Um, there's no question that's dumb. There's no concern that I haven't heard of. Um, literally on the way here, I had two parents reach out to me with two separate incidences in the same school district of the same kind. You know, my kid made this digital mistake. What are we going to do about it? Um, kids need to know from us that as we give this access that they are going to make mistakes. You are going to read things from your own children that will appropriately horrify you. Um, you will look at text messages, direct messages, emails, all sorts of chats from other kids that you love that come to your house and eat your Oreos. Um, and you will need to have some brave conversations with other parents, and it is not easy. So probably my very, very favorite book and something that I I really believe can change what's going on with our kids that are struggling and our kids in general is the self-driven child. Um, I've had the opportunity to bring one of the authors, Ned Johnson, to town a few times. Uh, I cannot say enough great things about his writing and his book. Um, and this is really shifting parenting um, from managing to consulting. Um, instead of engineering your kid's whole childhood, really taking a step back and taking the long view on grades and choices and activities and college decisions and all the things that we sort of get hyped up about. Um, what we know to be true, especially in affluent populations, especially in high achieving students, is when they feel like they don't have sense of control over their own lives, they do not thrive. And we're seeing that across the board. Um, our high achieving kids have been named an at risk group, um, not only for anxiety and depression, but for suicide as well. Um, so Joy mentioned that I do some work on suicide prevention, um, was never ever on my radar um, to do that work. But we had a cluster of suicides in the East Valley starting in 2017. Um, that sort of moved around the East Valley from Queen Creek to Higley to Tempe to Scottsdale to Chandler uh, to Gilbert. It's happening all over. It's happened, you know, on this side of town. It's happened within the Great Hearts Network. And so um, really, really understanding that the adult myths around suicide are a lethal hazard to our kids. Um, it is happening here. We do have students that are struggling and having those thoughts. And having those thoughts is actually pretty typical for tweens and teens to have what we call fleeting thoughts of suicide. And so difficult topic to talk about, but I will sort of give some strategies around what we can do to mitigate that. And Ned also talks about that in his book. Um, so again, uh, I think this book should be sent home with you uh, from the hospital with your baby. Um, additionally, so part of that fitting in versus belonging, um, also devices come into play. So a lot of kids that feel lonely, that don't have a sense of community at school, we find that they gravitate towards devices, um, whether it's scrolling or DMing someone or playing a video game or being part of the gaming community. Um, when you talk to students that game a lot, one of the things that pops up is, I have a lot of friends online. And when you ask them, where do your friends live? Do you know them? They're like, no, they live in Texas and Florida and Maine and all of these places. But to them, that sense of belonging is super important. And so really understanding what you're handing over, um, the access that they have is important. So a little bit of your homework. Uh, Childhood 2.0 is a documentary that Bark was a large part of. Um, you'll see our executive leadership and CEO in the trailer. Um, you can find this documentary for free on YouTube. 
We also have a dedicated website for the documentary. It's childhood2, the number two, movie.com, which will flash up on the screen as well. So I'd like to just share with you the trailer. Um, I cannot underscore the importance of watching this. Even if you watch the first 20 minutes and then two weeks later you, you finish you know, some of it, it's about 86 minutes long, but it's truly what's going on with our kids. Um, if you have children that are age 11, 12, 13, and up, and you are comfortable having conversations around the movie, I would do that. Um, I showed it to my girls. Um, I'm probably a little bit different. I used to teach eighth grade sex ed, so nothing, <laughs> nothing surprises me, and I'm super comfortable having conversations around things like sexting, predation, pornography, etc. So um, these things are happening. The average age of exposure to pornography is eight years old. Um, as you think about if you were part of the pornography industry, you want to hook the youngest of users and you want that person to follow that for a lifetime. And so where are little kids? Where are teenagers? Where is the supervision from parents lowest and where is it highest? So games like Roblox, games like Minecraft, games like Among Us and Call of Duty and Fortnite and all the fun things that they like to partake in, um, that's where they live. That's where these people live. They're very savvy. They talk as though they are a small child or a teenager, and they're very smart. You know, they're very savvy at sort of luring our kids in to click on this hyperlink and be my friend and all the things. So um, again, encouragement around, have you locked down your house tactically and logistically? Do you have the software and the hardware that you need that does the job for you? There's some fantastic things out there that I'll um, give you resources to at the end of the presentation. Um, but this is what I mean when I say that our kids are under attack. Like this stuff is out there and the kids are telling us like, nope, this is happening in my school, this is happening on the playground, this is happening on the bus, this is happening in my bedroom. A long time ago, families were in communities. They were local, they were small. I was born in the very depth of the uh, Great Depression. I was put to work carrying wood, carrying water. I knew how to shell peas, I knew how to break beans. We still didn't have electricity. I have two Instagram accounts. I use uh, Instagram, Snapchat. Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. TikTok and Fortnite. I can just scroll for hours on end. 11 hours a day. It's been eight, nine. Maybe like 12. It's actually been a way that we can keep track of them out there in the real world where things really are scary. The lives of kids were sort of changing slowly for a while. And then all of a sudden, most kids were able to get on social media and that's when everything skyrocketed. The rates at which they're experiencing problems continues to increase. We also know that the teen suicide rate increased 56%. Last year alone, we received over 18 million reports of international and domestic online child sexual abuse. We have traded a false sense of safety and security for actually putting our kids in riskier situations. I call it the race to the bottom of the brainstem. So it starts with techniques like pull to refresh. Pretty much every guy has like an addiction to it, but oh, yeah. no one talks about but it. But it's just faster now, and it's younger. Well, yeah, like nudes of girls go around the school all the time. At the beginning of the year, there were multiple suicides before school even started. There were men that wanted to talk to children at all hours of the day and night. Don't be shy. On Snapchat, one thought it'd be a funny idea to talk the other one into committing suicide. And she did it. She's dead. After about six weeks, we were able to crack his phone. Kids right now are going to experience the worst of what we're going through. I won't nervous. <laughs> the first time. Do you think your parents know that this happens? No. 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 My kid won't do that. My kid would never. My kid's school isn't like that. You're wrong. Because what they see, they feel neurologically compelled to do. Right now, we're effectively living in an experiment. How is this gonna affect us? We'll find out. So tonight I really just wanna share with you five protective factors of how we can surround our kids and protect them, um, not only socially and emotionally, but you know, with mental health issues as well as our academics. Um, and I think the number one factor is being a trusted adult. 
Um, I speak to students often. I spoke to 1,100 of them down the road at West Wing K through eight the other day. I speak to my own kids every day about you know what makes a trusted adult. And the number one thing that comes up over and over and over is reflective listening. Like my parents are actually listening to what I have to say and validating that what I'm bringing them is real and, and that they're gonna help me through that. Um, I think just because we have mature life experience doesn't mean that we can always directly empathize with some of the things that are going on. Um, I don't know how it feels to have somebody, you know, cyberbully me. I don't know how it feels to have somebody asking me for nude photos. I don't know how it feels to be watching somebody have a birthday party and I'm the only one that wasn't invited and I can see it in front of me. I, I don't know how those things feel, but I can certainly, you know, to the best of my ability, be vulnerable enough to say, like, that must really hurt your feelings. What's one thing we can do about this on Monday when you see so-and-so? And that's really what I hear from students is I can already tell what my mom and dad are going to say because even before I've gotten the story out, my mom, I can tell in her brain, she's already, you know, coming out with, like, ignore them. Go find some new friends. In a year, this won't matter. You're fine. Um, with good intention, because we don't want our kids to hurt, we often minimize by using one-liners like that. And for this generation, it's not going to work. You can't just ignore somebody, especially if you're of age and you have a device, because that person is still there. Um, you know, things in high school like breakups, it's all over social media. Um, whether it's the breakup itself or you're watching that person move on two seconds later with someone else, right? So everything is on the table. Everything is on full display. So I'd ask you as they come to you, one of the acronyms from Ned and Bill's book is WIGGY, um, what I got is. So as your kids are telling you things, one of the strategies is to reflect back with them. So what I got is when Chloe said this, it really hurt your feelings. So what's one thing that you think would work with Chloe tomorrow? Um, one thing that, a lot of things, but one thing that kids are really struggling with is the vocabulary to self-advocate. Um, we've done a wonderful job as parents and educators of swooping in and fixing things for them. Um, we're currently seeing, again, a generation that's really low in coping skills, pretty low on resiliency, but academically like complete rock stars, um, which is great. But those other life skills are bringing kids home from college. They're bringing kids age 5 to 11 to the ER with self-harm. Um, just this ability to cope has really gone downhill. And so I'll, I'll sort of outline how that happened and what we can do about it. Uh, protective factor number two, uh, the generation above iGen, so our young adults that are in college, have done a fantastic job of destigmatizing help seeking. Um, so we've been telling people for 50, 60 years, if you don't feel well from a mental health standpoint, go forward, go forward, go forward. And so here they come. And they've been coming for the last 10, 15 years. And schools are like, whoa, 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 like a we don't have as much help as you need. And some of our kids are beyond the reach of a school. Um, when a student is in what we call distress or acute distress, that is beyond the reach of your everyday educator and our training. And so really partnering with nonprofit agencies, consultants, people that can offer support also with our uh, behavioral health, health hospitals as well. Um, so these are the uh, 2010 and 2018 statistics from the American College Health Association study. I chose those because I hear a lot in my travels uh, that people think that COVID is the reason that our kids are struggling. Um, some kids did really well during that time. Some kids did not. Some families did well. Some families did not. Um, prior to COVID, we were in a world of hurt as far as the stress levels of our families, the stress levels of our children. And so from these statistics, um, although difficult to look at, um, I think it's really important just to point out that they're coming forward. And so as they come forward, we need to thank them, 
and believe them and say thank you. Thank you so much for trusting me with this. And I don't know exactly what to do about what you're struggling with, but I'm going to be the bridge to get you the resources and the help that you need. And so I'd ask you, you know, tonight and as you go forward, um, what is your family's emotional blueprint? Does your child know what to do when they're sad, when they're angry, when they're frustrated, when they have a first, a first failure, a first I didn't make the team, a first I failed math, a first breakup? Like Those are big, huge things, and uh, things have changed in the way that we deal with those things. Um, in my day, we were out in the neighborhood, and when we didn't feel good, like we were running around, and we were pushing and shoving, and we were getting some of that aggression and some of that yuck out. Um, our kids are withdrawing, and they're isolating, and they're using these devices as a, a crutch. And not only is the crutch numbing them out, but it's avoiding the big feelings and the face-to-face -face interaction that we get from what we call mirroring each other. I do want your kid to have a little bit of good stress. I want them to fail. I want them to not make the team. I do want them to get broken up with. Um, that's real life stuff. And as Ned says, we can't do hard things unless we do hard things. And so for some parents, uh, we've been like sort of, sort of over parenting um, with our own anxiety. And so really thinking about how is my parenting? Do I approach things with a non-anxious presence or am I actually trying to control the situation? Because often uh, we can't control what happened to our kid at school. We can't control somebody else's child. What I can say is the children that visit your home, the children that are in your car that you're taking to soccer practice to because you're a great person, great neighbor, great friendship group within the neighborhood, um, those kids make mistakes and those kids do horrible things to your kid. And some of those things are pretty typical yet inappropriate. And when we talk about other people's children in front of our children, we don't do our kids any service. Um, most children are not bullies. Most children that hurt each other's feelings, including your own, are having a moment with a very underdeveloped brain that said something that they didn't mean. And so this whole like bully victim thing that we've been doing for 20 plus years, it is truly, in my opinion, part of this youth mental health crisis and part of the reason that our kids don't know how to stand up for themselves. And so on that front, um, just really talking about who are these kids? Um, childhood has completely changed. There, there aren't a ton of characteristics of these kids you and I went through. Um, technology is a game changer. The bullying movement is a game changer. The fact that our playgrounds are staffed with 17 different adults saying, you're running too fast, don't touch him, you're getting too rough. Like all of this stuff has taken away natural energy and natural dynamics that happen between two children that when they don't happen, when boys don't get to push and shove within a safe you know, zone, um, that aggression stays within the body and that aggression comes out in the classroom. It comes out as throwing things, kicking people, rocking chairs, tapping, tapping your knee, like all of these things that teachers and educators see as off-task behaviors are often because we put them in such a restrictive box both in the hallway, in the cafeteria, out on the playground, that that energy has to go somewhere. And so it's absolutely going to come out in the classroom. And so really just thinking about childhood as itself has changed. Um, additionally, prior to age two, we've taken about 2,000 photos of our kids. So I get a lot of phone calls about why would he video record somebody going to the bathroom in eighth grade over the stall? Why would they video record a fight that happened on campus? Um, if we're super honest, we have literally been in their face with a device for a very long time. Um, we have created a digital footprint for them that they have had no permission in. Um, if you have a 10 through 18 year olds, I would ask you to think about when you take 7,000 photos of asking that child, like, do you mind if I post this? I love 
the fun we had at Disneyland. Um, as they age, they do not appreciate um, being posted about. They will say, please don't post that, and then we post it anyways because we love them and we think we're super awesome and we want everybody to know we're super awesome, right? Um, the rub in that is that we are only posting our front stage. We are only posting this illusion that our family is doing awesome and all of us in this room have sacrificed and failed and have been disappointed. And our children, when they get their own device, are only following your lead. People ask me, like, why is she taking 75 duck face selfies? Because you have taken 75 photos of her when she was eight years old. And now she has access to document her every move like you have. Uh, we also sit on our couches and we make fun of people in reality TV shows. And then we turn to our kids and are like, be kind at school. Don't be mean. Um, we do a lot of weird things. Um, and again, not shaming or condemning us, but if we're honest, they are really watching us. And the single best predictor of how your child will use their device is how you use yours. As far as this bully victim thing, I do a ton of work with school faculty and parents around what is bullying and what is not. Um, Kids are mean, annoying, and rude, and so are adults, and that is life, and not everything is bullying, and so we have to get super clear. If you want your child to cope and be resilient and walk through the world standing up for himself and standing up for others, and that's really what I want to create is socially competent kids who know how to hang on to their dignity. So um, this is just a graph of like post-Columbine, post 9-11. Uh, between 99 and 2001, we all freaked out. The schools freaked out, the feds freaked out, states freaked out, local districts, charter networks, and said, you know, this kid must be the mean kid. And this kid is like, oh, this poor sweet kid that's being picked on. Um, and part of that was, you know, the kids from Columbine were not only bullies, but they were bullied. And so the framework in most schools became there's an aggressor and there's a victim. And as a former school person, um, we often move the position of the victim. We protect the victim and like move him over here in this like space in our office. And then we suspend or refer out the quote bully. Um, most of the time in my experience with 60,000 students, um, those are two kids having a typical conflict that we have labeled as bullying. Um, most of the behavior that happens in most schools does not fit the litmus test of bullying. It is not malicious, it is not harassing, it is not intimidation, it is not relentless and pervasive. Sometimes it is, but most of the time it's not. And so getting super clear as a faculty and as a parent community around what is this you know, tolerance for stress tolerance as well as what is safe play? What is school violence? There's a huge spectrum there. Um, my sister has four boys and no girls. I walk into her house, it is complete mayhem. And I am like on high alert, right? Because I'm used to a much different energy. Her tolerance for safety is much higher than mine because of the rhythm of our household. Um, so really, as a faculty, um, kids run up against inconsistent adults where like this lady lets us play flag football and this lady says we're being too rough and they're staring at us like, do you guys really know what you're doing here? Um, and it, it, it's really hard for them to ascertain like in the motion of flag football, like how did I get too rough and why are you taking the game away? Um, so getting clear again on what bullying is and isn't, this is really where I live, like 100% of my days, teaching kids, teaching parents, teaching educators, like, do your students know what dignity is? Are they socially competent? Do they know how to use technology for good? Um, lots of conversation around the word dignity and respect. Dignity is inherent worth. Every person in this room has dignity, and it's been challenged along your lifetime. You may be even challenged today. So my goal for your child is, do they know, first of all, that they have dignity, because most kids do not know? Um, and secondly, do they know what respect means? Respect is a mutual admiration for another person. Um, when we say respect, I believe that most of us are after obedience and compliance. 
Like you'll do what I say and you'll respect me for it. As adults, as parents, we often say and do things, especially if you have multiple children, that take kids' dignity away. Like your 12-year-old hits your 8-year-old. Um, you're old, you know, you're old enough to know better. We don't hear the eight-year-old side of the story or the 12-year-old side of the story that's like the eight-year-old just called me a really bad name and that's why I punched him, right? Um, so as our students come to us at the school level, as kids come to us, making sure that both students feel like their dignity was upheld. Um, the imbalance of power between a true aggressor and a student that they went after. Um, that is the true definition of bullying. When there's a power def differential, it's pervasive, and there's a pattern. Often, there's just these back and forth that they have to have if you want them to thrive. Someone is going to offer them drugs in middle school, 100%. Someone is going to approach them online and send them a nude photo. Someone is going to want to date them in high school and maybe do something with them that they're not ready for. The sooner that they get this in check, that like dignity is mine to keep and no, you can't have it and yes, I'm going to fight like you know what for it, the more your child will thrive, the more their brain will thrive. Conflict is inevitable. Your kid's going to have some kids giving them a hard time. Abuse of power is likely. Um, we know that some kids are more savvy than others socially. We know the kids that can work the room. We also know the kids that snow the adults. Um, I am the mother of one of them, right? Um, so as these kids work the room, as these kids have a little more social confidence, um, we can have those kids turn that sort of energy into leadership and mentor those kids that maybe don't have those social skills. So there's opportunity there to recognize that those kids that were just born that way um, can also mentor some of those kids that don't. And so I think there's some leadership opportunities um, in there as well. Um, so just to sort of round out this section, um, the, the first two columns are 90% of what happens in schools and in homes. Kids are, you know, roasting each other, giving each other a hard time, slightly start to get annoying. Somebody poking your kid with a pencil, unless they are stabbing them and penetrating skin, is probably not bullying. It's totally mean, rude, and annoying, right? And so allowing your kid to practice a couple times of like what to say to that kid that's annoying. Um, where I do want you calling teachers and schools and intervening is absolutely this last column of true malicious harassment, intimidation, et cetera. Um, so this comes into play, obviously, both in person and online. Students that have access to social media, to text messaging, to direct messaging, they're getting hit on both sides. They're trying to fight for their dignity during the school day, then they're going home, trying to fight for it online. Um, if parents are unaware, it, it can be really crushing that they don't have that protective support around them. Um, I do want to share with you some digital mistakes that I've seen made over the years. Um, one of the talks that I do with students is about their digital footprint. Um, if your child is college bound, if your child is going to get a job ever, if your child is going to apply for an internship, they want to go into the military, um, the first place someone is going to go, as we do as employers, is to Google their name. And whatever comes up, they have about two seconds to make a good impression. Most of our teenagers have no clue that that is the case. A lot of our teenagers who are using social media are being disqualified from futuristic opportunities because their TikTok and their Instagram is like a total hot mess. Um, so I do a lot of talking to 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th graders, especially around, like, what do you want the world to know about you? If you are going to use social media, let me train you on how to use it for good. It's an amazing tool. I have former students who have gotten full-ride scholarships um, from major universities just by using their Instagram or their TikTok even as a showcase of their talents and skills. Ballerinas, baseball athletes, football players, artists, musicians, you name it. it it's easy to do when we sit down and give them the training um, that I believe they deserve. So digital mistakes, uh, it's really cool right now, especially uh, in middle school, to flip everyone off in your photos. 
Um, I don't know what that's about. I don't know where it came from, but super popular. Also wildly typical yet inappropriate, right? Um, this is the number one softball team in America. This photo uh, went viral. They got mad at the host team. They got sent home from the tournament. Uh, this photo went viral on the front page of the USA Today newspaper. When you Google these girls' names, this photo comes up 250 times with the story. So this is now a part of their permanent digital footprint. Um, this is an ongoing conversation. Teenagers, tweens, eight, nine, ten-year-olds have very short attention spans. Um, so saying things to them like, don't be stupid, don't post stupid stuff, means zero. You have to have these ongoing conversations around um, what do you want the world to know about you, and people are watching. They're looking for great kids doing great things. Additionally, anonymous hate pages, you know, people ask me, when should I give a phone? When should I give social media? Um, my current age is 45. Um, don't give it. Delay is the way. Um, anonymous hate pages and the ability to crucify somebody is there. If you give social media, if you give a medium to an underdeveloped brain, your child is going to be targeted at some point during their you know, 9 through 18-year-old career. Um, this is an anonymous hate page. Instagram allows them. They do not care about our kids. Uh, this is not a school issue. It happened on a Saturday, came to school on a Monday. So again, you know, Hayden, I hate Hayden. I hope she goes and kills herself. That is out there. There are 300 comments underneath that talking for Hayden, talking against her. Um, so you're Hayden, you're in eighth grade, and you go to school on Monday, and the girl that made the page has everybody together on the tennis courts talking about you. Like, it's just non-stop. So when people ask me, like, which app is the best? Like, you can bully somebody on Pinterest if you want. You could get on LinkedIn and bully somebody on the chat, right? Um, so there's no great platform, um, but what I can say is Instagram specifically, Snapchat specifically, TikTok, they don't care about our kids. They, all they want is your kids' attention and money. Um, and I wish I had better news for you, but this is what we've handed over. Um, for time's sake, I'm just going to skip her just to go on to uh, brains and close out for questions. Um, but really, again, getting to know that full development of the prefrontal cortex, so that good rational decision-making capability, 22 to 24 for our girls, and about 28 to 30 for our boys. So if you have a 7-year-old boy right now, he's not even halfway there. If you have a 12-year-old girl, she might be halfway there. You're going to see halfway there decisions, especially if you've given them a medium that they have no training on. We've handed over the Ferrari with no driver's ed, and they are crashing and burning all over the place. They have been for literally 20 years. 20, almost 20 years um, since the first smartphone and social media came out on the scene. Um, so when do brains go crazy? Um, this is, again, Ned. Um, something's novel. It's unpredictable. There's a threat to ego, and there's a low sense of control. Um, an example in the classroom might be, you know, Caden's rifling through his backpack. The teacher's ready. Everybody's ready to go to read a passage and he's like rifling through his backpack. The teacher's like, Caden, we'll wait for you. And the entire classroom turns and looks at Caden. That is a threat to ego. That brain only has three choices. I'm gonna fight you, I'm gonna flee you, or I'm gonna freeze. Most of our kids freeze, because they're like, if I say something, I'm gonna get in big trouble. Um, the freeze is often at home and at school misread as defiance. So we just continue to ask questions like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why'd you hit your brother? What happened first? Da, 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 da. And your kid is like this. Um, that's your cue to be quiet. That's your cue like this conversation's not going well. Um, the more we hammer our kids when we are in conflict with them, the more the muscle of the brain gets sort of like a super lane highway and little things become big things. And so strategy-wise, what I can tell you is when brains are online, these companies want to take your kid's brain and shove it as deep into the brainstem as possible. Their central nervous system is like literally on fire. If you put one of those like Garmin heart rate monitors on them, 
heart rate's up, blood pressure's up, as they get off of a video game, as they get off of social media. If you are seeing irritability, lethargy, um, just being a jerk, <laughs> not wanting to do something, that is not your kid's fault. That is absolutely not your kid's fault. That is a ton of cortisol, a ton of dopamine, and they're coming down. They're coming down as though they're on a drug. And so we have to be intentional about, like, if dinner's at 6, when and where are we playing games? How long are we playing games? Um, the average student is on a screen about 6 to 8 hours a day. Um, this school is probably a little bit different because of school-issued devices not being a thing. Um, but most of our kids are doing some really great things online as well. So I've got digital vegetables, digital candy. Where I worry about your kid is too much digital candy. Um, I also worry about that we have handed this stuff over and kids think like, this is mine. My video game, my phone, my iPad. Um, it is in your name. Anything that happens on it is your responsibility and liability. Um, so we have to do some massaging of the messaging around technology is a privilege, not a right. So when I look at students who are struggling, and people call me all the time, like, I'm really worried about my kid. All he wants to do is video game. My first couple of questions are, how is his sleep? How is his hygiene? How are his grades? How is his behavior at home and at school? If any of those five pillars of wellness are tanking, he doesn't get the privilege of the device. So video games, social media. Taking the brain, shoving it into the brain stem, amplifying the entire body, and then as they come off. So a couple strategies, make them move their body, like go run the stairs, go run in the backyard, go move your body, and drink water. Water will immediately dissipate some of the yuck, and you'll get your kid back. Just on the video game front, I'll go back to some of the positives about video games. Um, bracketing out some of, obviously, the violence. Uh, kids love the sense of community. It's novel, it's relevant, there's competition, there's collaboration. Um, boys specifically thrive on competition and collaboration. All kids thrive on instant gratification and rewards. So for a kid that's not so great at school, they can run home and be part of this community. I can be loud, I can be loud. I cannot be loud at school. So that energy that's not allowed at school is super welcomed on a video game. Um, so some of the attraction is actually some ingredients that I think that we can use in our classrooms. I do a lot of training within the Great Hearts Network around like, how do we make our lessons novel and relevant? Like these beautiful teachers are up against Netflix and Call of Duty and Among Us and TikTok. Like, you have to stand on your head. You have to stand on your head these days to be a teacher. So teaching has changed, and we've got to, like, these kids are expecting us to be relevant. Like, if they're watching TikTok, you better know what TikTok is, right? When I speak to governing board members, superintendents, presidents of charter networks, if you don't have TikTok and Snapchat on your phone and you have no idea what those are, then you can't make policy around it. You can't suspend kids around it. You can't expel kids around it if you are not relevant yourself. And so I really do feel there are some decent ingredients to video games within reason that can also uh, be used as part of the classroom. Um, lastly, uh, protective factor number five. Uh, all of us are posting, like, you know, our amazing kids and the things they're doing. Um, what social media gives all of us is that we get to be seen, heard, and loved. Those are the basic, basic human needs. Every person in this room wants to be seen, heard, and loved. Our kids need to be seen, heard, and loved. Those kids that you're raising, that you know, that maybe need a little more uh, than others, and again, I have one of them. Um, we adults call it attention-seeking. I call it attachment-seeking. So when kids are like, hey, me, over here, and we're not meeting those needs, they're going to do something to get your attention. All behavior is communication. All behavior is communication. The good, the bad, the ugly. And there's always a why underneath it. We have kids that are vaping. 
people call me like, what am I going to do is vape him? Like, what's his why? What are the dysregulated emotions that are going on? What's he trying to numb out? Is he stressed out? What's going on in the family? Like, there's always a why for behavior. But we often, especially in schools, prescribe to the behavior. Like, he threw the chair. Okay, he threw the chair. He's going home for two days. We've got to ask two or three more questions. What made you throw the chair? What is going on emotionally for you that you would put that chair in motion? Well, my grandma died. I'm super stressed out. My mom's so sad. There's always a story. Always a story under behavior or these emotions, right? So social media allows us to like post and get seen, heard, and loved. Kids that are shooting up our schools and shooting up our communities are desperate to be seen, heard, and loved. They're posting all over their platforms. There's no mystery. Every time we have an incident, I go straight to their YouTube channel, straight to their Instagram, straight to their TikTok. It's all there. There's no mystery. And so as you think about family members or people that you know that post all day long, like I tied my shoe, I'm going to eat soup, I'm going to the mall, like those are adults that are after getting their attachment needs met by social media. And it works, but the problem is it only works for like 20 seconds. You get some likes, you get some comments, and then you got to post again because you're like, I need some more of that. And that's where the addiction for our kids begins is the, the instant gratification, um, which again is not their fault. Um, this school safety stuff. Um, again, I, I get myself into things that I never thought I would talk about, but this second rung here, um, ideation and leakage. If we want these things to stop, if we want kids to stop harming themselves and harming others, we have to be paying attention to these devices. There's no mystery to their plans. About six to eight weeks before a student decides to perpetrate violence or a young adult against anybody, um, they're talking about it. And they often float the idea past a couple of kids like, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. You want to be a part of it? And our kids are not coming to us. I'm sure you've seen after every single one, there's a couple teenagers on CNN or whatever news, and they're like, yeah, he was really weird. He was really weird. He had no friends. He didn't say much. For like five years, he had guns all over his YouTube. Like, it's the same story every time. It, it makes me so crazy. Um, if we want kids to come to us and report this stuff to us, then we have to be trusted adults. As they come to us with little stuff and big stuff, the reason they don't come with this stuff is they are sure that we're going to screw it up and that it's going to come back on them. So this like notion around like, you know, if you see something, say something, it doesn't line up with kid brain. Because if I see something and I say something, I better know that she knows what she's doing or else I'm going to be a part of this and I want nothing to do with this because this is scary. So these pathways that these kids and adults are taking, most of them are on a complex pathway. Most of them are saying, I want to be seen, heard, and loved. This thing happened to me, and I can't get over it. And I can't get over it, and no one's helping me, no one's helping me, no one's helping me. If you take the, the child, 18-year-old in Uvalde, in third, fourth grade, people started making fun of him because he was poor and dirty and had a list. By fifth grade, he started skipping school. By middle school, he was truant and doing all sorts of, you know, nonsense in the neighborhood. By high school, he was telling people out loud, I'm not going to see my 18th birthday. This is a runway that we can stop. This is a runway where we can help and support these kids that absolutely do not want to do this. So what we need is our kids comfortable enough to come to us and say, this kid's saying some weird stuff, and I don't know what to do about it. Having anonymous reporting mechanisms, knowing that they can go to school personnel and report, and that people aren't going to overreact or underreact, because sometimes kids have reported that we've underreacted as well. So lastly, um, tactically, like from your house standpoint, I would love for you to consider taking devices out of the bedroom, having a central charging station, a lot of what's going on with our families is we're not getting enough sleep. Um, our children need 8 to 12 hours of sleep. At the junior high and high school level, most kids are getting about 4 to 6 hours. 
They're crushing academics. They're in 17 sports. We're running here and there and everywhere. Um, they are crumbling. They are crumbling. We have kids taking five AP classes so that they can go to NYU, like all the things. Um, in the history of my entire life, nobody has asked me where I went to undergrad or grad school. And, and I got hired, and I'm OK. And I think I'm OK. So this whole push for academics, um, you know, we're seeing some, some results from it that are not as great as they should be. Um, so devices in the bedroom. Nothing ever good happens on a device after 9 PM with an underdeveloped brain. They're texting. They're staying up too late. They're scrolling. They're watching porn. They're sexting. They're talking about drugs and alcohol. They're just staying up all night long. So if you can, not tonight, take devices out of the bedroom, um, that would be like a magic wand dream, uh, for me at least. Uh, social media, when should you give it? When you are ready for your kids to be exposed to a whole host of yuck. Um, there are communities of self-harm, communities of how to kill yourself, communities of how to roll a joint, like whatever you want, it's there. Um, so people often ask me, like, what's the best social media app to give out of the gate? None of them are great. <laughs> None of them are great. I would encourage you to open your own Instagram account and put in that you are 13. And within about four minutes, you will start getting direct messages from people asking you to do sexual things, offering all sorts of madness. Um, so I can't say anything great. Um, about any of the platforms, but if you are going to give it, if your child has it, you have to know it backwards and forwards. You have to have their login and password. If anything ever happened to your kid, the first thing that a, a police officer is going to ask is, number one, how do I get in this phone? So many parents are like, I have no idea. I have no idea what his password into the phone is. You have to know. Secondly, you have to know the login and password to every account that they have. Are they going to create extra accounts? 150% yes. Are they going to work around you? Yes. Um, I don't want you spending your time figuring out all of that. I want you focusing on the relationship that you have with your child and having open communication around, show me this. Show me Snapchat. Why do you want it? Show me Instagram. What do you think is so great? Why do you think I, as your mom, would be concerned? We're going to do this together. If you're going to give it, you have to do it together. Um, and, and a lot of teenagers are using these platforms and doing an OK job. But we have so many research studies and the science saying this is not great for kids. The CDC has said it. The Surgeon General has said it. We all know that it's not super fantastic. Um, this is just a snippet of what BARF looks like. So category cyberbullying. Sophia said this. Emily said that. So that's just a sort of a visual um, of what that looks like. And then lastly, um, stop playing tug of war with devices. It's ruining your family. It's ruining your relationships. Uh, we did this thing. We're like, happy, bir happy 12th birthday. Here's a new iPhone 27 XR. <laughs> And then you hit your brother, give me your phone. And then I'm so tired after tonight, here's your phone back. Fine, you can have it, right? Oh, you're not doing well in math, give me your phone, right? So this back and forth tug of war is chipping away at your relationship and the trust that you're trying so desperately to build. You're going to need that trust. The stakes are high, starting at age 8, 9, 10. Um, you've got to have trust because they are going to be, as I said, approached to do and say things that they're not ready for. And if they can't come to you because the trust is lost, they're going to go to a fellow 11-year-old and be like, should I do this? And that kid's going to be like, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, right? Um, so again, trust, relationship. People are like, what's the best app? You are the best app. Your relationship with your child is the best app as you navigate this. Um, so I will answer one question I get asked the most often, you know, starting at age 18 and working backwards, like what do you want to give? How much access do you want to give? And what do the incremental baby steps look like from let's say age 11, 12, 13 to 18? 
I want your kids to be able to know how to use technology for good and to take flight and for them to make the mistakes between those years and for you to be able to guide them through that. So students that don't get it ever have thrived. Students that don't give it, get it ever have completely gone hog wild, right? It really depends on the child. Um, if you have a child who struggles with self-esteem, they're going to struggle with self-esteem online. If you have a child that is high risk, came out of the womb, and is ready to go home with a stranger, they're going to do that online. So when we ask predators and we ask convicted felons of you know, child sex crimes, like how do you choose your victim? Low parental supervision and monitoring, low self-esteem. Those are the people that are you know, looking for kids like that. And we have some kids that are just not as confident as others. And so having some of these things in place, um, I'd also say your router, if you don't know what a router is, you need to figure out um, if you have a good one. Your router will do so much of the work for you. It will block and filter websites. It will filter out explicit content. It will tell you how many devices you have on your network. It will alert you when a new device comes to your network. Most secondary students between 6th and 12th grade have a burner phone. They have gone into your junk drawer and gotten your old iPhone 8, and they turn in their phone at night, and they have this other device in their bedroom that they're using. Um, they don't need like a data plan. They don't need a Verizon plan. They just need Wi-Fi. So when and if the iPhone 8 joins your network, that's your clue that, hmm, that's weird iPhone 8 is like seven years old. Um, so a lot. It's a lot. This is an extra layer of parenting. But um, first and foremost, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'll open for public questions. I'll linger for a few private questions. Um, but thank you again for being here. It's